The call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 89. The psalmist says, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. The heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too, in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for being able to gather in the house today to declare that you are our God and we are your people. We come to worship you, and our prayer is that your glory would fill this house. Lord God, that you would touch every heart that is here in gathered, Lord, and for those who are watching from afar. Hallelujah, Lord God, have your way in this service. Let everything be done to your glory so that your name, O God, is magnified. You, O Lord, are glorified in all the earth for your faithfulness throughout all generations. We surrender ourselves to you in the mighty name of Christ Jesus, our Savior, and invite you to have your way. Amen. Welcome to our annual African Heritage Month service, and we are so excited to have our Baptist Youth Fellowship bringing us a, a Black History Moment today. And so please welcome uh, Reverend Grace Gear, who is our Associate Pastor of Youth and Family and our Baptist Youth Fellowship. All right, good morning, everyone. As your um, Associate Pastor of Youth and Family, it's my pleasure to work with our youth and this morning they are going to give you their representation of what it is to be an Africa youth and of African Canadian descent and what it means to them and how it gives them strength. So I hope you appreciate their presentation um, as they come forward this morning. Thank you. My name is Sister Crystal Skinner. I am the uh, Baptist Youth Fellowship Supervisor. I'm going to sing two songs. Uh, one is entitled, Even When It Hurts, Even When It Hurts, by Hillsong United, and the other one by Tasha Cobbs, uh, He Knows My Name. Take this fainted heart, take these tainted hands wash me in your love come like grace again even when my strength is lost i'll praise you even when i have no song i'll praise you even when it's hard to find the words louder than I'll sing your 
tears. Hold me through the trial. Come like hope again. Even when the fight seems lost, I'll praise you. Even when it hurts like hell, I'll praise you. Even when it makes no sense to sing louder than I'll sing your praise. I will only sing your praise. He knows my name. Yes, he knows my name. He knows my name. with me and oh how he tells me I am his own you know my name you know my name you know my name Shoot me down with your words. 
You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the hurt of history's shame, I rise. Up from the past that rooted in pain, I rise. I am a black ocean, leaping and wide, willing, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind night of terror and fears, I rise. Into the daybreak that wondrous clear, I rise. Bringing the gift that my ancestors gave, I am the dream, I am the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. to share with you some information about a noble African Nova Scotian. The month of February is often used as a time to remember and celebrate our culture, legacy, and many achievements of those who came before us. I'm honored to be here today and share with you some information about Arnold Johnson and his many contributions to the Black community. Arnold Johnson was my great-grandmother's brother. Recently, I've learned many things that he has done for the Black community, and I am con and his constant desire to do more and make things better. Mr. Johnson was born May 21st, 1925 in North Preston, as we all know, Canada's largest Black community. As an African Nova Scotian, Arnold Johnson faced many challenging moments during his life. During these times of, tr of struggle, where he faced adversity, he managed to persevere and stay strong to continue to accomplish many things for the betterment of his community. He was an African Nova Scotian Second World War veteran who served in Holland as a radio operator and driver for the Canadian Army Field Headquarters fighting for our country. Mr. Johnson has many accomplishments with the goal of growing and developing his community. He was also a prominent community member. He was elected to Halifax County Council in 1965 and served as county councillor for his district for 12 years, proudly representing African Nova Scotians of this province. As councillor, he served as a member of Halifax County School Board and established District 16 Fire Department, as well as establishing Preston Area Housing Fund, the North Preston Residential Subdivision, including the first municipal water and sewer service in North Preston. As a volunteer, Mr. Johnson was a founding member of North Preston Great Prayers Association, the North Preston Daycare Center, the North Preston Medical Society, a founding member of North Preston Recreation Association, founding chair of the Joint Action Community, which has became the Watershed Association Development Enterprise Limited, and a founding member of the Black Culture Society of Nova Scotia, and many more. Arnold Johnson had done many remarkable things during his life. In July of 2018, in honor of the impact he has had on the community, the North Preston Sports Field was named after him for leading the way to achieve many goals that benefited his community. Mr. Arnold Johnson had always been very involved in the church community as well, having accepted Christ and being baptized in 1943. Arnold Johnson served St. Thomas Baptist, United Baptist Church, with many roles such as President of the Brotherhood, Usher, Treasurer, Building Project Supervisor, Cemetery Committee Chair, and more. Throughout his life, he has dedicated many years to helping develop and improve his community and giving back to others. Arnold Johnson is a well-respected role model who has done so much for his community in North Preston, and I'm proud to call him my uncle. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Unfortunately, another member of Deanna wasn't able to be with us today, so I will be reading for her. As people of African descent, we were created in God's image, as said in Genesis 1.27. Also, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. In Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew or Gentile, neither slave nor free, 
nor is there male and female, for you, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I will be also reading something I wrote myself that um, speaks about why I'm proud to be black youth. The answer to why I'm proud to be black is simple. Black people are incredible. I come from kings, pharaohs, and queens who ran dynasties and kingdoms. My people were leaders who led entire countries with grace and integrity, which means my bloodline is loyal. I'm from the continent home to pyramids and elephants. I get to be a part of a community that shares not only their struggles and setbacks, but its victories and its joys. The black community is more than just people with brown skin. The black community is a tribe that stretches around the world. We are all connected by our rich history that we can trace back hundreds of years. I am proud because my ancestors were resilient and resourceful. From them, I learned strength and perseverance, faith and hope. I have grown from my experiences and my challenges as a black youth. And I am proud because as I reflect on the history that I share with my ancestors, I am able to face tomorrow with faith in God and face the future with hope in my heart, which gives me confidence for my future generations. Fellowship for that wonderful presentation. Thank you for the uh, Black History Moment about uh, Brother Arnold Johnson. Yes. Um, it's a, a, a history I was very interested to hear since I didn't know it, so I appreciate that so much. And I want to appreciate Sister Crystal Skinner, who is our youth leader, and uh, 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 Reverend Grace Skier, who is the uh, clergy advisor for them. She's our associate pastor of YouTube family. And unfortunately, uh, President uh, Shaidi Oliver couldn't be here today, but we want to recognize her as well and all of the you who participate in the fellowship. God bless you. Thank you for sharing with us today. And now I'm going to invite you to bring an offering to the Lord, remembering that giving is a part of our worship. We give the Lord our very best gift, not knowing the next time we will be able to bring anything to God. And so... And so we just pray that you will uh, give generously as the Lord has blessed you. Amen. Gracious and everlasting Lord, once again, we just thank you for everything that you have done for us through this, uh, this week, dear Heavenly Father. We just give you back a portion of this use of where please give to us, dear Heavenly Father. Just bless the hands that are able to give and those who are unable to give at this time. May we use this for the building of your kingdom here on earth. All these things we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
blessings flow. Deacon Gary Bernard come and lead us in prayer this morning. Good morning, church. my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength and my life. And whom shall I be afraid? Let us go to the throne of grace. Our Father and our God, we come before you this morning, dear God, to give you thanks for this day. Father, first we wanted to thank you for waking us this morning, dear God and bringing us along this way, dear God. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for all you give and do for each and every one of us, dear God. Lord, we want to thank you for this opportunity just to be here today, dear God, to give praise to you. We want to just thank you, thank you, dear God, because today is our day of our Black Heritage Month service, dear God. We thank you for those who have come with us today, dear God, and come down to uh, do special presentations, dear God, for us today. Thank you, dear God, for that dedication and that ability to do that, dear God. We thank you, Heavenly Father God, for those youth today, dear God, who brought presentations, dear God. And we thank you, dear God, and ask you to watch over each and every one of us, dear God. Lord, we just ask you, dear God, because of this pandemic that's going on, that we are not able to receive all the people that we can receive because of conditions. But bless those who could not be here, dear God, and who would love to be here. Just watch over them and keep them in a mighty way, dear God. May our spirit move the road, dear God, to this place, dear God, and into hospitals and homes, dear God, with those who are not well, who are sick, dear God. Comfort and be with them, dear God. Watch over those, dear Heavenly Father, God, who've lost loved ones, dear God, whose hearts are heavy. Give them peace, dear God, and understanding, dear God, that they're only a ways, a little ways from us, dear God. Thank you, dear God, for all you give to us this day, dear God. We pray, dear God, for our sanctuary. Not completed yet, but soon will be. Because God, you don't bring us halfway and leave us. You take us all the way. And we're there in little ways. You're going to help us finish it off. I know it, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you. We just give you thanks for those who are working on it, dear God. And we just ask, dear God, that you continue to bless them. And we will soon be there, back in our own place, where we can give praise and honor and glory to you once again. We give it anyway, but we want to do it there because that's our place of praise, dear God. Thank you, Father God, for everyone that's here today. Lord, watch over and be with us, guide, and give us strength. Lord, be with those who lead us, dear God. Be with our pastor today, dear God, and bless and keep her, dear God. And be with those who ever going to break bread and bring the message, dear God, to us today. I just ask you to be with him and bless him, dear God. Be with our deacon board and our ministers, dear God, who are in this church, dear God, without means of fellowship and keep the doors open in this place, dear God. We thank you, dear God, for in this church, dear God, the people who run this church who allow us, dear God, to come here and do our services here, dear God. Thank you for their dedication and their kindness and goodness of heart to allow us to do this, dear God. We thank you for that, Heavenly Father God. Now, Father God, we just ask you to be with each and every one of us this day, dear God, as we continue on throughout this day. Bless, keep, and be with us. We ask all this in the one and only blessed name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray, Father. Amen. Thank you. 
from you, Deacon Bernard. And now we are so pleased to welcome this morning uh, Drs. Linda Carberry and Henry Bishop, who are going to come and bring us our Black History in Song and Narrative. We know them as wonderful members of the community. Of course, Dr. Linda is a member here at New Horizons Baptist Church, and so we are always blessed with her musical talents and such, and so we bless God for her this morning. And Dr. Henry, we know as the former curator of the Black Cultural Center, but a teacher of history and African drumming. And we bless him for his work in community. And we just pray that your hearts and minds will be blessed this morning. Doctors, come on. Amen. Thank you. One, two, three. September. Amen. We're here 
to tell the story from once we've come. Before I start my formal presentation, I have to tell you a little comical story. Am I part of this? You may be. <laughs> <laughs> my mother was a devout Christian, and she uh, was very active in many churches. She said to me when I was a child, there's one God, and there's many kinds of religions. So praise God wherever you are, even in your car, she said. So one day, she was on her way to church. Now my older brother was taking her to church, but he was late getting up that night. And my mother always would be on church on time, I remember. Amen. And so as we were going to church, my brother speeded up a little bit too much. And in the area where I live, there's a corner where the police usually just park their cars and wait for those who are breaking the law. Well, guess what happened? My brother was stopped by the police. My mother was quite frantic by that time because she said, look, uh, this is important. I have to do something today. The police officer looked at her and said, well, what's so important, ma'am? She said to him, well, I'm a bishop and I'm late for church. And the police officer escorted her to church. <laughs> True story. So freedom has beckoned us to come. And we want to make a change. We feel that the change is in our heart. Before it reaches our head, we have to go through the heart. And as time goes on, we want to make people believe that all these things that come to pass in our lives are for a reason, not for a season. It has a purpose behind it. This pandemic has a purpose behind it. Yes. It brings people together of all different backgrounds. Yeah. And some may not even like being together. <laughs> but the fact that they have a common issue has broken down barriers. God works in mysterious ways, folks. So let's talk about the story, the saga, the journey, the sojourn of our history. African Nova Scotians have been here for nearly 350 years in this province. The first evidence of an African presence in the Maritimes was that of a free man named Matthew de Costa. It is noted that he arrived in what is now Nova Scotia around 1605 still debatable but before this place was called Nova Scotia it was called Mi'kma'ki the home of the people of the Don the Mi'kmaq and the Milesi people later called Acadie some people know it as Acadia and so Matthew Lacoste's role was very important he was a translator for the French and the Mi'kmaq people. So obviously, if you think about that for a minute, he had to have some prior knowledge. He had to have some way of learning the language before he set foot on the soil of this area. We believe that he had been traveling around North America for a while and had a connection with those people of the First Nations. He was employed as a trade language translator with the French explorers Pierre de Gaulle Soudemont and Samuel de Champlain. He was very important, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. He was very important because he was a key player between the people. He had to be to tell the story of the connections of the fur trade industry that it has developed in the New World. And 
to be an economic boost for Europe and all across the Bay Area. It was believed that the cost had traveled widely, and although it didn't stay long in Nova Scotia, he definitely made an impact big enough to have written accounts of his visit here. Even though Matthew the cost of a free, emphasize that word free, many others were not. And yes, African slavery was a lot more well. Generally, the maritime provinces didn't have the death of slavery. But being in British owned territory, it was governed by the same laws and customs and traditions as England or the British Empire itself. It had a slave code, chattel slavery. Does anybody know what chattel slavery is? You are a property of somebody else. You have no rights. You are owned, bought, and sold at a whim. Black people were bought and sold as commodities, as any other goods, or even services. Slavery legally existed in Nova Scotia from 1600 to 1834. Once after that, there was a period of time where the slave holding still existed. Even though the British Empire had officially abolished slavery, slavery was still there. Undercover, hidden in plain sight. So people were still enslaved much longer than the law stated. It established a black subculture, wasn't it? A second or even a third class citizenship in Canada. In one case, this is the true fact, a bill of sale was shown. It listed potatoes and goods and various sugar and salt and nails and various tools, but it also listed a young African person for less money than a bucket of nails. What has come of that? Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows my story. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Forty thousand people 
displaced and traveled to various parts of the United States, back to France, and various parts of other areas in North America. How many have heard of the Cajun people in Louisiana? They're tracing their roots back to Nova Scotia. Then the English folk came. They were called the New England Planters. And sometimes people get that mixed up, you know. They think, planters, they must have did a lot of gardening. No, they were not that kind of planter. They were planted here to take over from where the Acadians left off. But along with them came enslaved black people to work the fields, yes, and do the planting. These people took over the areas that were most fertile, most rich in growing, the apple orchard areas, the fishing areas. It was a long, hard road for black people during that period of time. And then as time went on, various other things took place. And these major things happened because of war. How many have heard of the War of the American Independence? The American Revolution, 1755 to 18, 1782. This period of time was revolutionary, but many black people rallied to serve the British Empire. They were given an opportunity for freedom. They were promised land. I said promised. Doesn't mean that it was kept. And so that land was never really given to our people. That hundred acres and a mule. I don't know what happened to that mule. That mule got lost somewhere. And we only got a few acres of that land in rocky, barren territory where we were supposed to die and not thrive afterwards. This whole war started because of one thing. How many of you like tea? Mm -hmm. I like tea. But it was a Boston Tea Party. <laughs> that changed everything. Heavy taxes. In good old Massachusetts, where there was a revolutionary, and Christmas addicts, who was part of the revolutionary, fought against the British soldiers and was killed. The first African American to die in the American Revolution. The Revolutionary War severely affected the changes of how black people were treated. Then a British governor stepped up and said, black people, if you want to be free, serve the British army. Come to this side of the line, and we'll give you an example of freedom that you will never forget, that you never have known. This clearly stated that any black person who fled the American rebel plantation will be granted a free status. Hmm. In exchange for military service, in exchange for hard work, though. Some of these people who went to the other line were spies. They were called black pioneers. They said their own Ethiopian regiment. They had even the pals that said freedom for all on their coats. They risked their lives. They were sailors. A lot of our people don't realize that we were sailors. That we knew the waterways. This important part of our history was unique. However, we all know that the American Revolutionary War was lost by the British and the evacuation of over 30,000 people was 10% were African, Canadian, African-American had traveled 
in Nova Scotia and out areas around here, and they live in these areas, the descendants of Shiro here today. This loyalty to the king of King George III were issued permission to find new land, start new communities. They were listed in a book, you may have heard of it, it's called the Book of Negroes. You may have seen the movie by Dr. Lawrence Hill based on that same subject. But most of the black lawyers that were sent to the Maritimes were in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island. And at that time, most people don't know that New Brunswick and Nova Scotia were the same province. It was until 1785 that New Brunswick became independent from Nova Scotia. They established their homes and communities across the area, isolated. And these black lawyers didn't have an opportunity to find an alternative. But you know what their foundation was? Do you know what their foundation was? The church. The church was their meeting house, their political house, their social house, their banquet house, their therapy house. The foundation of our black communities has always been the church. Don't let anybody fool you. It all started under the church and the Bible. And it changed everybody's mindset when you saw these communities established for so long and so much heartache and grief. But you could go to church on Sunday. Yes. You could be in your pew and sit there and feel like comfortable. You don't have to worry about anybody telling you you can't sit here. You don't belong there. You can do what you want in your church. Doesn't matter what your status is, doesn't matter how much money you make, what kind of car you drive, what kind of house you live in, what part of the story you belong to. You become part of the, let me hear you, church. Say amen, somebody. Amen. This history is something that people don't realize. The foundation. Even today, we have over 50 historic black communities. Rural black communities are very important. And some people here from North Preston, it's the largest rural black community. Don't forget rural black community in Canada. Give North Preston a hand. It's still there. Technique that is still being used today. 
even in Jamaica today, with permission to go into a room territory. Yeah, they have their own laws. They came from the land of pineapple to Nova Scotia under a bogus treaty that the government has set up and said, you can come here and we'll treat your people, we'll give you money, we'll give you land, we'll, we'll give you money for your work. Don't believe the hype. These people came here under false pretenses. The government was so impressed with these haunty individuals, strong, well-developed people. They sent them to work. Does anybody know? Fort George is not far from here. We call it Citadel Hill in Halifax. Government house, just over here, adjacent to this church. Province house, just down a bit further from this church. The rooms were part of that building and construction. They had skills. They played a major role in the economy in Nova Scotia. They even established an old garrison that protected this Halifax city from an invasion. From whom, though? How many have heard of Napoleon Bonaparte, the great French dictator that was ravaging Europe and was about to attack Nova Scotia when they heard that the rooms were here? And he, Napoleon, knew about Haiti, the most independent black nation, where the rooms conquered the French who tried to take their community over. Therefore, many of the rooms were hired to protect the city. They were put in various places around North Preston, Cherry Brook, and East Preston. If you go to the Atlantic Funeral Home area, you'll see in the, around the back of this funeral home, there's a plot there. It's called Maroon Hall, where the rooms used to have their own place. For social activities. All these areas and the rooms were frequenting. They tried to divide and conquer. Some were sent to live over into Middle South, what they call Maroon Hill. And then others were divided up and sent to Guysborough. Hmm, interesting. That divide and conquer still seem to be intact today. And so our history is something we can learn from. Four years after their arrival in 1796 and 1800, the Maroons left here. And may, I might add that prior to that, some of the black loyalists also left. 1200 to be exact, on January 15, 1792, left Nova Scotia as well prior to the Maroons, and ended up going to a place called Freetown, Sierra Leone. Mm. This history is very unique. And I even talked to some of the Sierra Leoneans that come back here to Nova Scotia, and I asked them, did you learn about Nova Scotia in your school? You know what they said? Of course, brother. I learned about you people. And I'm so happy to be home. Home? Uh, home is Africa, man. No, no, no. Nova Scotia is my home. The history is reversed. It's so unique. Their people are called Creoles there. Our ancestors prayed under a big cotton tree, cottonwood tree that's still there today in the center of town in Freetown. And they named the city Freetown, which is the capital city today. The Maroon's reputation still existed. They're still feared, they're still respected. How many heard of Usain Bolt? Yeah. Passes down on the planet. Yeah. He's a Maroon. From the same place as the Trelawney that came here. Bob Marley. Have you heard of Bob Marley? 
He's a maroon. Same connections. And so that whole idea, it sounds so sweet, doesn't it? It's a sweet spirit. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face. There are sweet expressions on Again, 
in the evolution of this war. But without the First Nations on our earth, we must never forget the First Nations that helped our black people for so many years and still continue to help today. The Mohawk warriors saved the day. And during the ship battle, the USS battleship Chesapeake was attacked and secured by HMS Man of War Shannon. And it actually sailed right into Halifax Harbor in 1813. Most of the sailors on that ship were black men. These individuals sought for their freedom and came from Virginia, the Carolinas, Maryland, Georgia, the Sea Islands, the Geechee, and the Gula people. Their roots are found even traces in Nova Scotia. If you go to a certain place called North Preston, at home, you hear this language, this lingo, this vernacular. It sounds like Bill. <laughs> Which can be traced right back. We've studied it. We've traced it. In 1814, 200 years, a declaration was again offered for liberty to anybody who wanted to serve into the British territory, the Royal Navy in particular. These able bodied men and families proved valuable. They served as spies. They served as scouts and guides, cooks, hunters, very functional, very important key roles. It's important to know that many black men brought their families, their wives and children along with them and protected them from any of, any of the adversity at that time. Who said we didn't care about our families? The backbone of our, our nucleus, of our community is the family. The foundation is what? The church. And over 2,000 ventured to this area between 1814 and 1816, settling in, in this province and in New Brunswick. Seafarers were very valuable. The whaling industry. And a lot of people don't know about this piece, Reverend Britton, that black men served on many of the whaling vessels because they could get their freedom as long as they were serving in an industry that gave them a job. So any of the slave catchers, they couldn't bother them. The captain of the ship would say, no, these are my crew. One of the most dangerous jobs in the world was whale vessels capturing the whales. Tremendous danger. But the black men wanted freedom at any cost. So these lands that they got when they came to Nova Scotia were in the Windsor area, somewhere in other parts of the province, maybe in, down in the Campbell Road area, which is now Africville, somewhere in Lucasville, Beachville, Upper Hammond Plains. And now these areas are still established today. Strong family backgrounds. And if you look at these areas, think about this for a moment, and look at their names. In every community, you can tell. My family is from Weymouth Falls. My mother was a Cromwell. Oh, you got to be from Weymouth. There you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's where all Cromwells come from. And so the connections, if you have a name, you can tell where you're tracing your roots from it. That's a beautiful thing. And so I have this uh, interesting little, little sidebar here. Sidebar? It's a sidebar. You can't eat it though. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very nice little uh, indication of how ingenious our people are. Uh, this is a copy of an actual letter 
that was sent uh, from an archives in California to us. And um, this is a gentleman that wrote back to his master in 1820. He had escaped, we believe, on the Underground Railroad that came to Nova Scotia first. Yes. And he wrote back to his master, but here's the kicker. He could read and write. That was illegal. He could read and write, but he had the audacity to write back to his master. <laughs> Can you believe that? And he writes like this. I'll give it not vernacular. I'll give, I'll give you his version, kind of not verbatim, but kind of like just how you would think about it. Dear Mr. So-and-so, I'm in a place called Nova Scotia. I don't wish you were here. <laughs> I'm doing very well. I have a job. I'm a ironsmith or blacksmith. And I have a shop in a place called Preston. And I have found the people very nice here. Don't come looking for me, because I doubt that you will find me, because up here we all look alike. <laughs> and so he, he sends his letter back. But guess what, Reverend? His master, former master, was upset, and he says, I'll get it. This escaped slave, this future slave, I'll, I'll put up a bounty for ten thousand dollars for his head to bring him back. But he was smarter than the average man. His name was originally Barker Shanklin, but his trade was an ironsmith or blacksmith. I wonder what he could have done to change things. We think he changed his name to Smith. Have you heard that name before? Yeah. <laughs> if you look around, you see a lot of Smiths in communities around here. That's right. But look at your trade. Look what, what they're doing. Look, look at their, their occupations. And I think that's what Mr. Barton did. Slave catchers, bounty hunters came to Nova Scotia, and they asked about this guy who had escaped. And guess what they were told? Are we all Smiths up here? You decide which one you want to take, but you better take us all. This history is so unique, it's so wonderful to hear about it, because these people were powerful in their own way. It's impressive, because they were on their way to Canada. Ooh. Better known as Canada. Yes. Right or wrong, huh? And we have to talk to you. <laughs> right or wrong? Right. <laughs> I'm waiting for the song. <laughs> I'm on my way to Canada land. Come on, folks. I'm on
Without history, it would just be geography. <laughs> and so that's unique that our young people got to learn their history. They got to find out about what they know, what their heroes and shields, what they had accomplished. And World War One and World War Two contributions of African Canadians is second to none. I'm sure you've heard of the Tuskegee Airmen. And, you know, you, you hear about all these great individuals in the United States, but not many people know Canada's contribution. The second battalion, Canada's best kept military secret, was a segregated battalion of black men from all parts of the provinces of Nova Scotia and the United States and the Caribbean islands. Established in 1916, two years after the First World War was Although all the commission officers were white, there was one <laughs> who happened to be a reverend. His name was Reverend William White. <laughs> and so that's the father of the famous Portia White, Elon White, Lauren White, you may have heard of these people. And what's unique about that, Reverend White was a close friend of a man named Dr. Dan Murray. I may not ring about him, but if I said Ann Murray, the songbird of Spring Hill, you may have said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's Dr. Dan Murray was Ann Murray's grandfather. And Reverend White and Dr. Murray became buddies in the First World War. So Dr. Murray was the only white doctor that would serve the black men. And many of the times when you hear about these black men dying and being sick, no the white doctors would even touch them. They were afraid of being contaminated. But Dr. Murray said, no, they're people just like we are and they deserve the treatment. One of the people, however, that I have to tell right now is my own personal family. He's my great uncle, my grandfather's brother. His name was Arthur Benson Cromwell. He lied about his age to sign up to go to war. He had to be 18. He was 60. A year later, he died of pneumonia. His body never came back home. He died overseas. And in my research as a curator of the Black Cultural Center, we found his burial plot in Jura, France. I told my mother he was alive at that time. She broke down crying because nobody knew where Uncle Benson's burial was or what happened to his body. We got his war medals back. He was given the military uh, war medal of merit posthumously. And so we made a connection. But many other men were like that as well. They came home without any pensions. No recognition. You still had to go in segregated areas of the community. They couldn't go into various places in the restaurants and sit at certain tables or other places in theaters. Very, very few were given any equal opportunities. So they just went back home and settled with their families and made the best of it. But I must give credit right now to the late, great Senator Dr. Calvin Rock. Some of you may have known him. He was one of my mentors. And he wrote the book, Canada's Black Battalion, The Best Kept Military Secret, which became the number one book in Canadian history. That book is now made into a movie, Honor Before Glory, you may have heard of that. Anthony Sherwood, who was a famous actor of CBC. Uh, he's written many screenwriting 
and he did a tremendous movie on this as well. The federal government has just recognized them as well, and the stamp has been out there on that history on the number two. Last year it was the 100th anniversary of the disbanding of this group. In the Second World War, much like Mr. Arnold Johnson, who served there, this war changed things for black men and women. They served into blatant racism, regiments, and platoons. They risked their lives and their families' lives as well because they were exposed to many of the diseases at the time. Not coming back with any vaccinations. There was nothing like that. They were black pilots who never got much recognition. I'm sure you read the Tuskegee Airmen, like I said, the Red Devils. But we had our own black pilots in Nova Scotia and in other parts of Canada. Overall, the past has always been a lesson for our future. How many know that the great Dr. Marcus Messiah Garvey came to Nova Scotia? He was born in Jamaica. He came here in Halifax and in Cape Breton. Whitney Pier, Lace Bay, New Waterford, he was there too. And one of his major sayings, a people, take note, a people without knowledge of their history is like a tree without roots. Can I get an amen, somebody? You see, our roots are very important. Strong roots give you a strong tree. The importance of what heritage is crucial in knowing your identity, and knowing where you came from, knowing who our heroes are. People like Reverend Richard Preston, the founder of what? The African United Baptist Association, and formerly the Cromwell Street Baptist Church in 1832. The African Friendly Society, we believe Richard Preston was a conductor of the Underground Railroad. His history makes perfect sense. He came to Virginia. We believe Richmond area, served here in this Halifax area, travel around the province. Hmm. I think he did more than just preach. I think he was setting up different stations, safe houses. He was brilliant. And so, we have that history that's very powerful to know about. How about Abel Seaman and William Hall? BC. What does BC stand for? Victoria Cross. Victoria Cross, amen. Victoria Cross is one of those difficult awards anybody could ever get. He was the third Victoria Cross winner in Canada. First Nova Scotian and the first black man in history to receive that. There's now an actual ship being built. Give it a hand, a ship being built in his name, right here in Halifax Shipyard. HMS, going home. How many have heard of Miss Edith Drummond Cleveland? Yes, indeed. And I'm going to just touch on a few people. There's a lot more. Famous Master Weaver traveled to Vancouver, British Columbia, to represent Canada as an arts and crafts icon. Her master making can be traced back to Angola. Angola in Central Africa. Dr. Ruth Johnson. How many heard of her? Icon and activist of Africa. The late great Dr. Burnley Rocky Jones. Yeah. Say amen, somebody. Yeah. I had the pleasure of working with Rocky, one of my mentors again. Brilliant person. Activist. Lawyer. Dr. Doreen Lewis. Yes. Worked with her at NSCC. First. Mayor, woman in North America, 
the back of my sin. Incredible. See, all this history, all these things that we learn, and I just want to touch base on this one because, you know, I don't know if I got here. Let me see if I can find it. Ah, I did bring it. Wow, wow, wow. Anybody know what this is? Viola yeah. Desmond? Well, what's this $10 bill here? What's this going on here, Henry? Well, why is this $10 bill not horizontal? And why is it vertical? I'm going to know why. Well, I'll tell you why. When it designed this $10 bill, it was a bank note from the Canada Mint. I was sitting at the table. And they talked about all these people that made great things. And I asked them, did they know about Dr. Rosa Parks? Yeah, we know about Rosa Parks. She even came to Nova Scotia. Have you heard of Viola Desmond? Who's that? 1946. Rosa Parks, 1955. Both great women. But Canadian born? Went to New Glasgow, sat downstairs in a theater that was segregated because she couldn't see very well. She was paid the extra penny to go upstairs, but she said, no, no, I want to sit down here. The balcony is too hard for me to see. The fact that she was able to do that against the odds, she was charged for defrauding the government, put in jail, and that's the LACP helped get her out of the situation. They still lost the case, but back in the early 90s, thanks to who helped her? Who can tell me? Governor General. That's the governor. May and Francis. That's not the 90s, brother. In the 2000s. They helped her give her a royal pardon. So that whole idea of this money being this way is unique. Because she stood up when she sat down. So women of all backgrounds could stand up for their rights. Isn't it a wonderful thing to see this? This is a unique $10 bill because it's won an award just because of its design. Well, this one has a stamp now out there. Uh, there's a ferry that travels in all parts of Dartmouth. Um, there, there even was a minted coin, a twenty dollar coin. I think it's it's out or later this year. Twenty dollar coin. I think it's silver. And so, all these things are coming to pass. Her sister Wanda uh, has been very gracious and kind of perpetuating the whole history of her sister, Viola. You see, black history, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, is, is our destiny. It lives on in the hands of those who paved the way for us before. We stand on the backs of those, on the shoulders of those who, who gave us an opportunity. Our future of the human race depends on the actions of those who live a higher moral standard, a higher way of thinking. Let's all cause some good trouble. A man named John Lewis, congressman, United States, before his passing, kept saying, oh, good trouble. They made some good trouble. My mother always said, Henry, stay out of trouble. I don't know if we're in good trouble. Well, to be active in things that aren't just. Not just us. Justice. To change things that you see. Don't let them go. Don't turn away. Don't get a blind eye to them. Speak out. Speak out. These are things that make a difference. You may lose a few friends along the way, but they really weren't that good friends in the first place. 
But you need to stand up for things. You need to make a difference in the community. In Nova Scotia, black lives matter. Black heritage matters. Black identity matters. You matter. You're valuable. It doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. You can make a change. You can take a stand. And you can make a difference. We think that today is history making. This is the first time Dr. Luna and I were part of the New Horizons history. And we want to come back. We want to make you, know, you realize that we can do more for you as well in spreading the word of history. We hope that you enjoyed this presentation. We hope that um, you'll take it to heart. We want to thank Reverend Rhonda Britton, Dr. Britton, for inviting us and the officiating and their uh, administration of your church for allowing us to come here today. We feel very honored and very privileged to have this opportunity. Because to us, this is our church as well. You know, I'm not a member. I, I like to say um, adjunct. <laughs> But it's because of Christianity that we stand tall yeah. and we make a difference in everybody's life. Yeah. If you don't stand up for something, you're laid down for anything. That's right. So, in conclusion, just a hot second here, Dr. Hammond. Do you mind if I say a few words? Absolutely. You've been speaking all morning. <laughs> now, I don't talk much. <laughs> There's just a few things I would like to say. Is that okay with you, brother? That's perfectly all right. Okay. Amanda Gorman read a very beautiful poem during the inauguration. Yes. Of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Yeah. And the, the last three lines really stood up for me because she said, there is always light if only you were brave enough to see it. If only you were brave enough to be it. Salami Bay, you know her, Henry? Yes. Singer, songwriter, actor. She once said, at no time, at no time, dim your light for no one. When you're doing what you think you're supposed to be doing, don't dim your light for no one. And the other point I want to make is, really, Henry, we're supposed to be the light for each other. We're supposed to be the light for each other. There's enough darkness out there. What we're supposed to be doing is being a light so that we all can shine. That's what God wants us to do in there. I know that much. Amen to that. And that's why I want to ask your assistance with this song. And I know just about everybody knows this one. And if you don't know it, pretend you know it. <laughs> That goes for you too. <laughs> I, I, I want to mention that our assistant in the piano series is to Kevin Parks. He's a minister of music from St. Andrew's United oh. Church, not too far from here up the road. So just like, give him a hand for coming out and supporting us. Thank you. He's my brother from my mother. Oh. <laughs> Watching him. <laughs> this little light of mine.